sign upon his precious skin. I will know my Savior when I go to him by the mark where the nails have been. Amen. told from the prince of fools by the mark where the nails have been by the sign upon his precious skin I will know my savior when I go to him by the mark suffer so all my sin was paid for a long long time ago by the mark where the nails have been by the sign upon Good morning, everyone, and welcome to First Presbyterian Church of Santa Monica. Uh, we're glad that you're here, and it's the first Sunday of the month, which means that today we will be celebrating communion or the Lord's Supper together. So if you'd like to participate in this meal together, we, um, we invite you to, uh, to find whatever bread or juice or wine that you might have available at home. Uh, you're, of course, welcome to just listen and experience this time as a reminder of God's grace and God's love for you. Uh, if you um, are free, we'd love for you to join us for our Zoom coffee hour at 11 a.m. today. Uh, you can stay for as little or as long as you'd like. Uh, and if you've been reading the Lent devotional that we've sent out uh, during this time and would like to share just anything that, that you've read that is meaningful to you, uh, we'd love for you to share during that time. But, of course, uh, no pressure. Uh, finally, next week is Daylight Savings Time, so remember to set your clock ahead on Saturday night. If, however, you forget and you show up for our service online at 11 a.m., uh, why don't you come over and join us for our coffee hour first, and then the, the uh, service will be available anytime you want to watch it. Uh, so, again, we're glad that you're here, uh, and please join me in prayer as we continue in worship. Jesus, we thank you for your closeness and your presence with us through all the ups and downs of life. We pray that you'd continue to join us together as a community, and we pray that you'd continue to give us a vision for how we might be a reflection of your, your healing and caring presence in this world, uh, in, in our relationships and in our wider community. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Good morning and welcome to Children's Time. As we continue through the season of Lent, we are following Jesus and his disciples in the city of Jerusalem where they went to celebrate the Passover festival. Last week, Jesus arrived at the city riding on a colt. Jesus came to Jerusalem as God's anointed king, but he was a very different kind of king than the people were expecting. Jesus came as a servant king, one who was willing to suffer and even die for his people. Today we follow Jesus to the temple. There was only one Jewish temple in the world, and it was in Jerusalem, and every Jewish person wanted to go there during the Passover festival. The Jewish religious leaders in the temple were responsible for making sure that God was worshiped in a proper way in the temple. But when Jesus arrived at the temple, he got very angry. Let's watch and see what made Jesus so angry and what he did about it. It was the week of Passover. Jesus, his followers, and many other Jewish people traveled to Jerusalem to celebrate. Jesus and his disciples went into the temple area. What Jesus saw made him angry. In the area around the temple, people were doing things they were not supposed to be doing. Some were buying and selling animals for sacrifices animals like oxen, sheep, and doves. Other people had set up tables, and they were exchanging money. The Jews had to pay a tax at the temple, and they needed to have the right kind of money. So the people at the tables traded for the money accepted at the temple. And still other people were carrying supplies to the temple area, using it as a shortcut to get from one side of the city to the other. This was not what the temple was for. Jesus made those people leave. He pushed over the tables of the money changers, and he pushed over the chairs of the people selling doves. Jesus did not allow people to carry supplies to the area around the temple. He wanted the people to learn something important. Jesus said, is it not written, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations? Jesus told the people, you have made this temple into a den of thieves. Not only were the people wrong for doing business there, they were not fair in the way they did business. They charged people too much money. They were misusing the temple, God's house. Jesus was right to be angry. The religious no. leaders saw that the people were amazed at the things Jesus taught and at the miracles he did. Every day, Jesus went to the temple to teach people about God. People who were blind came to Jesus and he healed them. People who could not walk came to Jesus and he healed them too. 
children began shouting in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David. The religious leaders did not like what was happening. Do you hear what these children are saying? They asked Jesus. Yes, Jesus said. Have you never read the scripture that says, you've prepared praise for the mouths of children and babies? The religious leaders were afraid of Jesus, so they started looking for a way to kill him. That evening, Jesus and his disciples left Jerusalem. They went to the nearby city of Bethany and spent the night there. Now Jesus knew that worship in the temple at that time required animals and money changers. But for him, the religious leaders had gone too far. And as a result, the temple's primary purpose to be a house of prayer for all nations was no longer what the temple was being used for. So Jesus reminded them by turning over the tables and by letting the animals go free that they were not worshiping God the way that God should be worshiped and that they needed to change their ways. Now challenging the religious leaders in the temple on their own turf was a dangerous thing for Jesus to do. The Bible says that at that point, the religious leaders plotted how to kill him. But that didn't stop Jesus. He continued to share God's love and show people how to live God's way every day in the temple in Jerusalem. And you know what? The people came to see him and to hear him. So let's say together, God loves me. God is for me. God is always with me. Thank you, God, for Jesus' ministry in the temple. Amen. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. God is a safe place, so says Psalm 46. A, a refuge, a place of strength when everything is disrupted or falling apart. So far in the Psalms, we've called God majestic because life in our world is good. We see God in nature and, and all around us. There is beauty and complexity and diversity and meaning. But life can also be not good. As we see in the Psalms of complaint or as we see whenever there is injustice or inequality. But in these songs, prayers and poems, there is room for us to be honest and real with everything. As we all know, life can be ever-changing, which can be good, but also sometimes unsettling. It's like going to the beach and standing in the sand as the waves cover your feet and then, and then rush back into the ocean. It's that, that pulling back that comes with the strange feeling of the ground or the sand moving or shifting under your feet. Do you know what I'm talking about? You're standing in one spot, not moving, but everything all around you keeps moving and changing as the waves come and go endlessly. As we've been talking about for a few weeks, the sea in the ancient world was a symbol of disruption and chaos. But in the stories of creation, God holds back the waters, which brings order and creates space for us in this world to experience something good. But the waters are, are relentless. The waves keep coming, which in the eyes of the biblical poet is a reminder that the forces of chaos are constantly trying to reclaim its space, constantly threatening to pull us and the, the ground beneath us back into a constant state of chaos and disruption. So this metaphor will once again drive the story and meaning of our psalm for today. So let's, let's listen as we uh, walk together through Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. 
another translation says, God is a safe place to hide, a refuge, a place of strength and, and stability when everything is falling apart. This first line anchors us just as the waves start to crash. Therefore, in verse two, we will not fear, though the earth should change Though the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble with unrest. Again, in ancient times, our, our world was often imagined to be like a giant bubble surrounded by oceans. The land was holding back the sea below us and the sky, like a, a vaulted ceiling, was holding back the sea that was above us. Like a beautiful cathedral, the mountains were like giant columns holding up the sky. So when this Psalm says, though the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, what's happening? Right, the sky, the sky is falling. And just like this phrase in English, we don't literally mean that the sky is falling, but it feels like our world is falling apart, right? Can you feel that? The gift of the poet is that this dramatic visual language expresses something more than information. When we're hurting, it's just not quite enough to say things are not going well. Well, yeah. This might be accurate information, but it doesn't express what we're actually feeling. So imagine being a teenager or, or remember being a teenager, um, trying to, to um, get up the courage to ask someone out for the first time. You have spent months, maybe even years thinking about this moment. You've memorized exactly what you want to say. You've imagined what they might say, and you've got a perfect response for almost every possible scenario. In your mind, you're calm and funny and cool. But just like every coming of age movie ever made, usually nothing goes according to plan. So, so when your friend asks you, well, how did it go? You could say, not great, but that doesn't really capture the feeling of embarrassment and, and shame that, that is really hard to shake off. It's less literal, but it feels more accurate to say it was a disaster. Because these four words paint a picture for us of a tsunami or a massive earthquake with buildings falling over and things catching on fire and the sound of sirens in absolute chaos. Yep. That's what it felt like. So the sky is falling, which for us in the modern world probably paints a picture of thousands of fiery asteroids bombarding us from above. But the biblical poet, or for the biblical poet, is if the sky is falling, how would they imagine it? Right, a sea of water coming down to flood everything. Now, I only say this because it's the water metaphor that's important. This is not science, but a poetic picture of being overwhelmed by experiences and feelings in motorcycles, <laughs> feelings of chaos. How will we survive? But just when things can't get much worse, the waves pull back. And now in, in verse four, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy presence of the Most High. God is in the midst of the city. It shall not be moved. God will help her when the morning dawns. There in Jerusalem, anchored by the temple where God is present with the people, water is contained. It's no longer a chaotic and destructive force, but a, a life-giving, refreshing stream that nourishes and sustains us. Can you feel that metaphor as well? Can you see your lawn and plants growing and turning green again after a rain or, 
or after you turn on the sprinklers. Life is returning. Can you feel just how refreshing and satisfying it is to drink a cup of, of cool water when you're so thirsty because you've been working or playing outside on a hot day? Can you feel that? This is how the poet experiences the presence of God with them through the ups and downs of life. We are anchored and we are refreshed, strengthened so that um, when the next wave or the next wave or the next wave hits us, we will not so easily be knocked over. Now, we know that the church is, is not a building. We are the church. God's spirit lives in people. So, so remember this whenever we have another human being standing in front of us. Oh, God is, is with and for this person. God is with and for you and, and for me. And th this means that the grocery store can be a meaningful place where we encounter God. Our homes and our work or the playground can be meaningful places where we encounter God. I mean, even the freeway can be a place where we encounter God. So as long as we don't lose sight of the people and of God's caring presence everywhere, it's not a terrible thing to have a temple or a church building. We do, after all, have bodies. We live in a physical world, which means that we need a physical place to gather together, to create space and art and community and reminders of God's faithfulness, to have a space that carries memories pointing us again and again toward God and toward one another. The temple served this purpose for God's people in Jerusalem. And I know that this church building has served this purpose for thousands of people over the years. And we will get back here. And my hope and prayer is that this church space, when we return, will continue to be a truly safe place a place of welcome, a place of care, and a place of service. It's okay to have a space that helps anchor us when the tide starts to rise and the waves become bigger and more turbulent. It's okay. So notice how this psalm uses waves as a metaphor, but also how the rhythm of the poem invites us to feel the waves coming and going, to experience it, as if we were there. You see, we begin the psalm in a safe place. Everything is calm. But it's followed by waves that threaten to destroy everything, followed by a calm river coming from the presence of God, followed now by more crashing waves. This time in verse 6, the chaos takes on a new name, the nations and the kingdoms. In verse 6, the nations are in an uproar, the kingdoms totter as if they're going to fall over. He utters his voice and the earth melts. These are the empires in the ancient world and today who, who were seduced by wealth and power and military strength. Looking back through history, these nations and empires come in violent waves causing all kinds of pain and chaos. The Egyptian Empire, the Babylonian Empire, the Assyrian Empire, and by the time of Jesus, the Roman Empire. But history also shows us that empires eventually get swamped by their own greed and violence, so that even the greatest empires fall as new empires arise. But once again, the waters become calm. In verse 6, the Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come, behold the works of the Lord. See what desolations he has brought on the earth. Wait, hold on. I didn't, I didn't expect this kind of a wave. Um, desolation doesn't feel like the kind of good works of God that, that I might imagine, or that you might imagine. Desolation feels really destructive. 
But Eugene Peterson has translated this line in a, in a very different way. Instead of behold the works of the Lord, see what desolations he has brought, the message translation says, see the marvels of God. He plants flowers and trees all over the earth. Now, honestly, I, I don't really know how he got from scorched earth to a, a flower garden. So, so maybe we should just keep reading um, in the next verse. Uh, verse 9, God makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear, the, the drone and the atomic bombs. He burns the shields with fire. Okay, so God's work is, is the end of violence. God's work is, is an end to exploitation and inequality. God's work is to clear the field for a, a planting of new flowers and trees and all kinds of good things that will begin to grow. The psalm closes. Be still and know that I am God. I am exalted among the nations. I am exalted in the earth, here. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Be still. We've been standing in the ocean as the waves come and go, and, and I don't know about you, but, but I'm exhausted by the constant movement and change. So be still. Take it deep breath. Be still and take a, a deep breath. Be still and know that God is God, that God is with us, that God is holding us and sustaining us in the midst of the waves. As we are invited to this table this morning, we remember that all are welcome, without exception, because it's here at this table that we remember the grace and the love of God for each of us. It's here at this table that, that we are anchored through all the storms of life by the self-giving love of Jesus. Because it's here at this table that we remember that it was on the night that Jesus was arrested that after giving thanks to God, he took the bread, breaking it, saying, This is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after they had eaten, he took the cup, pouring it out, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant or the new promise poured out for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. 
do this in remembrance of me. As we are joined together by God's Spirit today, this is the bread of life, and this is the cup of God's great salvation. Amen.
Please join me as we pray together. Jesus, we come now to entrust our lives to you, to entrust the people we love to you, to entrust our world to your goodness, your grace, and your love. As we experience all the different waves of life, waves of joy and celebration and happiness, we're thankful. And as we encounter the challenging, turbulent, difficult waves of life, the struggles, the pain, the grief, we come to you for strength and comfort and hope. So in this moment, we take just a a minute to breathe, to recognize that you are with us. And we pray for the things that are on our hearts and our minds today. Finally, we lean more heavily into your goodness and your grace as we pray the prayer you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father in heaven, holy be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
there's no